It's road time. Welcome to Rolanda On Demand. I love my podcast because we not only tackle the tough issues of the day, but we deal with hot topics, celebrity interviews, and information that can help you in your business or relationships. This is Rolanda On Demand. Fantastic to be here. Nice to see you again. Yeah, you know, we have talked for so many years over so many different racial unrest times. And I always kind of turn to you, not only because I need answers myself in trying to continue the dialogue about race, but also because you have this soothing sense about you. You really do. And I feel that these are tough things to talk about without becoming angry because it, it's based on anger. But I want to be one of those people in the forefront of the racial dialogue who is bringing peace without patience, but still peace. And you offer tools in terms of talking about that. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's great to be back on your show. I always love it. And it couldn't be a more opportune time to talk about these issues than right now. You know, and I also, I have to be very transparent here. I don't know too many people who do what you do, David. And I can remember times when it probably wasn't popular to do what you do. Let me tell you a, a bit about David Compton. You might have seen him around. And if you have, I know you remember him. And if you don't know him, go on YouTube. You know how we do. Look people up and see some of the most fascinating videos of this man in action. Um, Dr. David Comp is also who I adoringly refer to and many others do too as the race doctor. He is also the dialogue coach. He is also known uh, from Trevor Noah's comedy late night show as the white people whisperer, because what David does is dedicate his talents and gifts and skills and strategies, tools, tips in helping white people talk to other white people about things like the election and race and politics and poverty and whatever else, fill in the blank. But David, you say the dialogue has to start among the majority. This, this whole race issue like David, like, like uh, George Floyd, this is a conversation that isn't just with black folks. It's gotta be our white allies talking amongst each other as well. Well, not just talking about each other. We, it's gotta be white people talking about each other, including people who consider themselves allies uh, and people who are, would not be considered allies or consider themselves allies. Part of what happens is, is that we have to face the fact that in our very polarized society, like it's really white folks who are polarized. If you look at the election results, for example, 2016 election, black people 8% vote for Trump, Hispanics 27% vote for Trump, Asians 26% vote for Trump, uh, white folks 58% vote for Trump. So you, you, the real split is among the white community. So if you think you, at Thanksgiving, you see all those um, shows about worried about the Thanksgiving dinner table. Well, that's a white problem. Now it's a real problem. Like that, you know, when you have a population of people that split almost in half, and, and it's a very divisive split these days. What needs to happen is that um, what we have to figure out. Uh, and if we're going to figure out how to make Thanksgiving great again, we're going to have to have <laughs> white people are going to have to learn how to talk to each other across that divide. There was a study a couple of years ago that found um, that it looked at people's uh, people's feeling about talking across the I like Trump, I don't like Trump divide. Mm -hmm. And what you have was like, you know, is it is, do you find these conversations stressful and frustrating or do you find them stimulating and interesting? Right. So 52 percent of conservatives found it stressful and frustrating. 56% of black liberals found it stressful and frustrating. 51% um, uh, of Latinos found it stressful and frustrating, but 74% of white liberals found it stressful and frustrating. So you, so, so you got this divide among white people, the white, white liberals compared to other, uh, other liberals are the most disinclined to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, but, so, what, so what I hear you saying is that if you think the conversation between black and white friends is tough, Imagine white to white is even tougher. Well, it, well, it's 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 tougher. It's more it's more like this. It's more possible, but people are less inclined to have it. And these people are in the same families, and they're in the same neighborhoods, and they're in the same churches. Like the the, the way our social segregation works, you know, most uh, you know uh, our most white people don't have a lot of black friends. Most black people don't have a lot of white friends. 
So we're in these same groups, but we're not talking to each other, among, especially among white people, because they disagree. So what I'm saying is, is that part of what I have noticed and what that poll suggests is that there is a, there is a, not a communication problem. I find that there's a compassion problem. I find that, that a whole bunch of white folks, um, they have a real aversion, a real a lack of compassion for people in their own families, in their own groups, for other people who look at politics differently, look at race differently, look at Trump differently, look at these issues differently. And you know, I have my perception is that people of color have found a way to absorb the fact that there are people in their families who have different views than they have. Whereas like a lot of white folks seem to like um, throw each other away in a way that, uh, or, or, or like they, they can't handle the difference. And I think that that might be because people of color over the centuries have recognized that um, there's a certain interdependence that's needed in families. Like even if I don't like your views, uh, I still need you if we're gonna survive as a family. Whereas white folks have not had that oppression that forces people to, to get along in that way or to tolerate each other that way. And thus they, I, I don't like, you know, I'm, I'm, people told me, you know, I, I decided I wasn't gonna talk to my cousin until uh, Trump's out of office. <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, this is the person that you 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 have passed the tissue at funerals of your relative. Like, these are these are these are your people, right? So, so I think that part of what we have to recognize is that this is there's a severe split in the white community, and people have to learn how to talk to each other. And but so, David, if it was tough enough, I mean, last Thanksgiving was tough enough to talk about Trump at the dinner table. Now you've got the day the 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 uh, the George Floyd situation you've got you know were they looters were they you know protesters I mean all of this racially charged conversation police brutality well the police have never treated me that way and then somebody you know it's the old meatloaf and Archie Bunker situation again you know right, right, it's right. like That's how true. do you have that conversation and this one is even more charged I yeah. mean coronavirus all oh, that's fake news all the rhetoric that comes with the Trump and anti-Trump people were already at each other. Now they're going to be fueled with this coronavirus and fueled with the George Floyd and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, it's going to be Thanksgiving. It isn't even here yet. You're in Corona, you're in coronavirus quarantine. Well, okay. That's remember. So, so, so I want to support what you say and push back against it. Okay. So, um, it's going to be really bad because it's going to be after the election. And so somebody going to lose that election, although there's always a possibility he'll contest it, which makes it even worse, right? So, yes, that'll happen. But if we notice, there has been some shifts. Like if, we, if we look at, for example, all these protests that are happening around the country, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of white folks who are, who are saying this racism thing has to stop. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, I just saw a poll this morning that suggested that there has been a, at least right now, we'll see if it reverts, there's a big portions of, of white people like around in the 70% range say that there is there is systemic problems around the way that police treat black people. That is a new thing. This same thing was polled around uh, four or five years ago and it was like 40, 40. Now it's 74, 24. So, so, uh, so, so part of what is happening in this moment, the reason this, this could be a breakthrough instead of a breakdown mm -hmm. is because there's been the, the, the the George Floyd situation was so egregious. We all saw essentially a public lynching. It wasn't ritualized, but eh, okay. The dude, the, the dude is killing him. He 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 knows he's being filmed and he don't care. With so, his hands in his pockets. So the reason, part of the reason why this is outraged around the world is because in fact this is so outrageous, because in fact that we can't we can't even process some reason why this might be okay and what's going on with him. So because of that, um, people are more upset and it more highlights the racism problem that some have been talking about. And even it shows it for people who have, have been in denial about that or, or resisted that. So there's an opportunity, right? There's an opportunity to take the conversation to a new level. And part of what I'm really trying to do is to give people the skills of doing that. If they have the conversation the same old way, if the, if the people who think racism is real are bringing that same kind of condescending attitude, a kind of a boorish attitude, a kind of a, I'm better than you, you know, the, the, the whole, the, the, remember the whole deplorables business from, from uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign, a basket of deplorables? Right. Well, part of what happens is that progressive people look at conservative people, look at Trump supporters like that. 
Well, people, first of all, that's insulting. Second, it plays into the narrative that Mr. Trump plays that those people don't, they don't, they disrespect you. They, um, they look down upon you. They don't want to share power with you. And it plays into the grievance narrative that he creates. And essentially, he, you know, he's a divisive figure. He a division, on. all division. Right. So, so part of what I try to get people to do is to uh, increase their compassion uh, uh, because they have to have an attitude of compassion to be most effective and also to give them the skills on how to use that compassion attitude to manage conversations in a different way. So, in fact, Thanksgiving is less divisive. So... <laughs> I love the analogy. I mean, here we are in this in summertime and we're already talking about Thanksgiving, but it is so that when you say that, it's almost like the most, you know, you look up family, it's the most explosive word of the di dictionary. And, but, but what we're talking about is as we have the dialogue, David, is that the, that the, that this kind of, this kind of progression starts at home. Um, right. I mean, yeah, we can talk about that, Gary, but you know, J July 4th and Labor Day coming too, right? So, right. <laughs> so let's take, uh, no, no, we're still going to be. Okay, so, so uh, let's take us into an American home. And there's, there's the white family, and they're pretty split over what just happened here. I mean, forget Trump. What just happened here for on American soil that the whole world is looking at us as an embarrassment? When that conversation comes up, g g give us the tools. What can we do to snap into it so we don't. Right. So, uh, so the first thing you have to do, um, um, well, is to say, okay, we're going to start out. We're kind of we're trying to find our agreement and then expand the zone of agreement, right? So the good news in this case is that I mean, it's 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 so horrible that the way Mr. Floyd was killed, but the the from a dialogue standpoint, the reason it's useful is because we can all agree that that was bad. Like in, in, in a bunch of other these killings, even when people are getting shot in the back. Even when, I mean, they're egregious in various ways, often we couldn't even agree that that was a bad, a bad, that was bad. Like, and so, so what's unique about this and represents opportunity, I mean, when you have Sean Hannity saying this was a bad cop killing, yeah. you know it's bad, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, you know, because the old narrative has been, oh, well, you know, that black guy must have done something. He must have done something. Well, the cop's under stress. Or he, right. He, he felt he feared for his life. I mean, you can, or this is just the way it is. Hey, another one bites the dust. I mean, well, pretty well, much. The, the, yeah. Right, right. Well, there's an empathy problem that there's underlying all this. That, that that's what that one's involved. But the silence but, is violence. The bigger one, the bigger one, I think is more commonly is I understand where the cop was coming from because he feared for his life, or the guy must have done something wrong. Here, in this case, it, it, those don't work. So what I'm saying is, is that you can start from, you know, wasn't that awful, and you can also agree, I mean, that even though people weigh the, uh, the negative implication of the violent protests differently versus the, uh, the actual violence, even, you know, Killer Mike, these black mayors, these black leaders, they all don't like this violence. So you start out by agreeing that the, not only was the death bad, but the, 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 the violent protests were bad. If you're a progressive person, you might want to talk, first talk about how the violent protests made the conservative person feel because part of and, and and don't yeah but it like like part of what people do is like they might they might ask you how you feel but yeah but yeah but yeah but and i think that that strategy doesn't help you build trust or expand the zone of agreement so stop walking in with your own argument ready to go right you know, re relax a minute ask questions and try and try to find uh, like i teach people um one thing to remember from a persuasion standpoint is the ABC, agreement before challenges. Like if you're trying to really influence somebody, what you want to do is to find as much agreement as you can before you try to challenge their view, right? I like that. You that's a good one. It, right? So, so that's important to do. So you can agree that the, the violent protests were bad. You can agree that the killing itself was bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you can start talking about, okay, um, the the nonviolent protests. Let's talk about them for a second, because of course the vast majority of these protests are nonviolent. Even though what gets in, what gets on the news more, as more makes more better for better TV, is the violent protests. But the vast majority are nonviolent. And let's remember, a whole bunch of these violent protesters are white folks who've come in 
to the agitators. The agitators and, 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 and either from the far right or the far left. And, and some of those people are actual professional thieves. Like a part of that, that's a whole other thing taking place in this. Like part of what goes on is you got professional thieves coming in to take advantage of the looting and the violence that perhaps the agitators are doing. And, and you know what? I will say this. I was happy to see that the news did work very hard to differentiate those groups. Now, I don't agree with looting either or burning anything, but a protest is a protest, and both got the attention. Um, sadly, it had to go there, but yeah, people are going to, that's the first thing they're going to say is they're going to point to, well, now look at those looters and try to start this racial right. firebomb, gaslight in the situation. Right. So, so, so you've, you've established that the thing was, uh, was the, the, Bad. the violence were wrong and the killing was wrong so then let's okay, can you talk let's talk about the peaceful protesters and then and and how, i think a uh, part of what people don't do is to ask a person who's not inclined to be aligned with them and say well how, what do you why do you think that they're doing that like to get them to do a perspective taking exercise that, that's a that's an that's a useful conflict resolution and persuasion tool to get the person that you're disagreeing with to like in, in, a, in by way of invitation, what do you think is going on with these other people? Now, that, notice, it, it notice. Yeah, it diffuses the momentum of see them, look at them, look at them. And instead of going, well, they're doing it because they're angry. Why don't you ask, why do you think they're doing that? And it There's really right. does change the energy of the whole situation. Uh, right. They, they can't, they don't have much of a problem with. Like you, they, they start, the peaceful protesters, they're not gonna have much of a problem with. So you start with, what, why do you, what do you think is going on with them? Right. What you agree upon, yeah. Right. Um, well, you start the agreement, and then like, what do you? Th these people protesting, pro you know, people protesting the American tradition. Why do you think these people are protesting? So you can have that conversation. Now that there's a couple of footholds in that conversation too, and that is like, have you ever felt mistreated by an institution? Like even your typical white person who uh, has probably had some situation in their life, if they're over thirty, where they felt institution treated them poorly and were frustrated. So that's one toehold. If the uh, after the other conversation, what do you think is going on with them? Another toehold is. Have you ever done anything uh, out of frustration that ultimately undermined yourself? Like to, to, to part of, again, you're, tr you're trying to build bridges of empathy, right? Because most people have done that. Although they're, they're all like, I don't know, why do people burn down their own community? And they <laughs> don't remember that they have done things out of frustration that hurt themselves. Oh, you've thrown a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so my point is, is that, Notice there's a sequence that I'm describing, right? You're, you're, you're approaching the conversation with some strategy. You start out with agreement, ask a question, have them do a perspective taking, give them some reminders or ask, ask questions about experiences that they may have had. And, and, and if they don't have it, then maybe you have it. Maybe you have done something that you regret it. So you show that you have empathy for some people, not, um, not because of their position, but because you've done something like that. Well, then I would suggest that later, the third phase is like to probe the issue of racism. Now, this conversation might not happen in one conversation, right? Part of what, you, part of what you're trying to do uh, from a, a bridge, bridge building standpoint is to have a conversation where you get to be yourself and the other person who disagrees with you leaves it saying, I wouldn't mind talking about, talking to, uh, about them, talking about this with them later. Right, because part of what happens is that people are so obnoxious with each other that they don't want to talk, that they have such a bad experience, they don't want to talk about it anymore. And that, I know. That silence keeps racism in place. Ah, I know, but it's like those conversations, like, David, there are times I really want a conversation with some of my friends who have not said anything about anything about, I'm not that I expect you to have a political battle on your Facebook page, it's your Facebook page. But it just seems like they would have said something at this point, you know, and I just, I don't want to have that conversation because it's too painful. Well, they might not want to have that. They might not want to put up Facebook postings that you would find supportive because they got people in their, uh, in their life who are conservative folk, who are racism minimizers, who they're, cre they're create disruption in those relationships if right. they do that. And they don't know, neither of them know how to have a compassion-based exchange of views that are, where we're going to probe how we feel and do so with compassion and openness and, and <clears throat> tolerance. So they're not trying to, so who look what happens? They don't post it and you mad <laughs> because. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, but I, you know, and I don't want to say, oh, that, that, that I'm not trying to say, oh, well, that means you're racist, but it just kind of like, 
you know, these are people who ask me to listen to their kids rap music and, and, you know. Right. So, so, I mean, so, so part of, again, and and that's a whole other thing. Like one of the things that uh, I have found is that um, there's a whole bunch of interesting silence around racism in black, white friendships, right? Whereas I would predict that you have, uh, or you, or, well, there's nobody of your ilk because you're so special. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Most, many black people who have white friends have, the, the, the friendship is not like a um, racism discussion friendly conversation. They've almost agreed to not talk about it because on some level they've agreed because the, the white person is nervous and the black person is nervous and the white person says something wrong, I'm not gonna like them no more, right? So, right. so, part of, so the, and that what, what that does is creates a hole in their relationship because the, then, the, then the person of color, they, they're talking about racism with their black friends, but there's a whole, if, if I can't talk about a active part of my life that I have to manage, then that limits the real psychological intimacy of our relationship, right? So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but just to, just to finish that whole thing out, so, you put off a discussion about what is the level of racism that happens until a couple stages down in the conversation. And then you say, okay, well, let's go find out about that, right? Let's, you know, and again, that's why this might, this might last more than one conversation. So, you know, there's a history of uh, these kind of incidents in Minneapolis. There's, that, that can be, you, we, got, we all have the Google machine in our phone. There's a history of these, of these situations in wherever city you're in. And there's research about how, how people of color are treated. So notice you're doing all of that before you get to the thorny question of what might we do? What should we do about the level of racism that happens? What should we do when uh, people who believe in violent protests mix in with people who believe in nonviolent? Like you, but you, you, you wanna wait for that conversation until you've done the other work of building trust, of doing perspective taking, and then of trying to get some information we can both agree about, about the nature of racism that, uh, that impacts that moral question. Hmm. People want to go, part of what happens is people right, right, want to go right to the moral question, and they got whole different senses of, like, what's the information about the level of racism? They, they, don't, they don't have any agreement and therefore trust. Well, so, I, I, like, I like that. That's a great takeaway. The ABC asked before challenging. Uh, and uh, and I also no, 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 no. what is it? agreement before challenging? Well, say what agreement before? Oh, agreement. Oh, okay. Agreement. But I but agreement before challenging. Okay, but I like I I think what I was tapping into was the 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 exchange, the asking of you tell me your story, let me share mine. That to me is so important. I believe that storytelling is what's going to save the day, and that's what's going to create the the empathy. And I love the the agreement and exchange of ideas and and the, finding what i what i usually call the least common denominator you know when i'm trying to tell a journalistic story and sell it to the masses i always try to find that least common denominator in humanity we all want our bellies full our babies fed our houses warm let's start with the humanity and then that's right so so basically you you got you, it's funny you got the other thing right like like the the, as the, the method I teach of having conversations about racial issues is called the race method. Which I is- love this part. Tell them this one. This sure. is my favorite one. Every time you tell this story and milk it because it's great. I'll highlight, as I tell it, I'll highlight that it's based on two principles and you said one of them. So one of the principles is uh, exchanges that are about storytelling are more effective than changes about quote unquote facts or beliefs. So that's one principle. And the second principle is ABC, alignment, agreement before challenges. Okay, now those, you put that together and you get the race method. Race stands for reflect, ask, connect, and expand. And so what does that mean? So reflect means calm your butt down before the conversation happens, (laughs) take some deep breaths, (laughs) do whatever you have to do so you can gin up your compassion and get in a place of center so you're not just reactive. That's, that's, That's reflect, ask. Ask questions, get your conversation partner that you disagree with to pass, ask enough questions that you're talking about, they're talking about a story that underlies their belief, not just their belief, because them telling a story has y'all have a different kind of a heart-based exchange as opposed to a head-based exchange. Reflect, ask, connect. The connect part is the agreement part. 
so that you try to find something in what they've said that you can't agree with. So you don't, so at the beginning of this conversation, you don't, they, they don't believe racism is a factor. You do still, whole, still whole bunch of people don't think racism is a factor, right? You do, but you, so, so you, you don't necessarily focus on that. You're going to, you're going to get to that point, but you want to, agree, you want to connect with them by finding something you can agree with. And that might be that there are a lot of good cops out there. So they, they tell you something about how, you know, they, they think that, um, you know, that, that, that George, that uh, George Floyd case was an exception, but you know, there's, that's not, there's not a lot of racism out there. So you don't, you don't agree with that, but you don't necessarily challenge that. At first you say, you know, there are a lot of good cops out there. And then you tell them a story. I mean, they told you a story that, that you asked, you had them ask and you tell them, they tell you a story about why they believe that there's no racism out there. Your response is not to correct them. Your response is to connect with them. Connect, don't correct, right? So you're trying to tell <laughs> I like that. You're trying to tell a story that shows, let's say, there are good cops out there. You have a good cop story, so you tell that story. This is all in service of later on, you're trying to expand their view. Then, so later on, you tell them a story about something you've experienced or know about and, and from an experiential basis that says that racism is a real factor. By the time you get to that, you know, you've established rapport. You've, people, one of the things that happens is that people um, have more empathy for your view if you show some empathy for their view first. That's, what, that's well documented in science. So this, is, this whole thing I'm describing is science-based. It's based on what we know about neuroscience, but and my objective is to try to package it in a way that people can remember and do it. That's why mm -hmm. you talk about race. It's the race method, so you can remember what you're trying to do. We are talking today with Dr. David Kopp, one of my favorite interviews over so many different platforms, David. How many times have we been here talking about race? It seems to be something so important to do today, especially. Uh, he is a called the race doctor. He's called the dialogue guy. Trevor Noah calls him the white people whisperer. And his whole platform is to just put the things out there on the table. Let's talk about it. But I really love that we have some some strategies, some ways to 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 enter the conversation with not weaponry, but some some assets to help us bring peace and dialogue. It's so important right now. I, I'm really encouraged that you're encouraged, uh, and that so many of us are as we watch Paris and 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 China and places yeah. all over the world standing up, believing that black lives matter. It's finally making a move now. The needle is moving, I think. Right, that's right. And so, but, so what's, what's critical <clears throat> is to keep it moving is that, you know, white people got to start talking about these issues differently. So one of the things that I try to teach people is that the most valuable and potent weapon in your arsenal as a white person talking to other white people who are in racism denial I, I call those people, by the way, I don't call them deniers because that's disrespectful. I call them racism skeptics because, <laughs> because they're skeptical that racism against people of color is a bigger problem than racism against white people. It, uh, as the, the polling data tells us that 55% of white people think that racism against white people is just as significant as a, of a problem as against people of color. That's 55% think that. Now, I'm not sure that's true. That was true two weeks ago. It might not be true now, but that's right. True. <laughs> So, so part of what I'm trying to do with the White Ally Toolkit, whiteallytoolkit.com, um, is to try to get people to uh, talk across that divide between the 45% and the 55%. And the goal is to, is to shift that 45% number to 50% to, 50 to move it by five points by 2025. That means a whole bunch of white people got to talk to a whole bunch of other white people using best practice in best practices in persuasion, which of course are thankfully based on compassion. We're, we're lucky to live in a world where the best practices are compassion based. So I try to teach people how to do that. And I think that this moment is so rich in possibility, but it's vital that uh, white people talk to each other differently in these settings, in informal settings where there's no super, there's no facilitator, there's nobody running it but they're bringing dialogue methodology, just basic dialogue practice. We talked about the principles of it and a method. So those conversations have a high chance of being connecting and not destructive. Well, now, David, what do you think about all of these corporations now coming out? I mean, I'm, I, I have many movies on Netflix and animations, and I felt so good as being associated with Netflix when 
They came out and said, we are not, we're putting our foot down on racism. And so many other companies have come out and uh, stood by that. And there are also companies that people are pointing out in social media who are big Trump supporters and they're saying boycott those. I mean, what are you, is this just feeding lip service both ways? I saw, I saw a great post yesterday that said, uh, somebody said, um, I love, I love your company for its uh, uh, Black Lives Matter Instagram post. Uh, can I see the membership of your board of directors, please? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know something, I, you know, I have worked for a lot of businesses in the past year and you walk in and look both ways and you don't see anybody of color right, right, right. and, and you just wonder, wow, you know, how, I guess you hire who, you know, and if we're not opening our hearts and our doors and our, you know, and, and cross culturally uh, connecting, it's a shame that now we have to. It, I'm amazed at pro how, probably how many good friendships were made across the lines in those in those in those pick those picket lines or the protest lines and people who were boycotting or or, or whatever the bondings that were these unusual accidental tourists who are now bonded by you know by one common least common denominator as we talked about and that is bringing more understanding compassion well, so i mean it's about time right it's about yeah time. yeah a, a movement i mean part and of you can't say you can't say you don't understand the issue anymore you know yes you can it's i mean you can't say you don't know that there is one is what i mean or you i mean i don't know how you can so, but i guess there are people who do it every day which is why we're having this conversation you can do that i mean i, I think that i think that part of what we have to I think there is willful ignorance. Okay, you can't deny the knee on the neck. You but yes, you can. You can do that too. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, let, let, us, let, let us really appreciate uh, the, the way that human beings can twist their thinking. You know right. that dude on, um, on Fox News, like the, the black guy with the Italian name, D Dan Borneo, and he's a former Secret Service agent? <laughs> he was up there on, on, on Fox News talking about how, well, this was a bad killing, but let's not put race in it. So I'm just saying, let us not make presumptions about what is obvious. That, yeah, that, that, yeah. that making too many presumptions is what undermines dialogue. Mm -hmm. you See, right then and there, I needed the race method. <laughs> I mean, there are people. I mean, there are people who believe this was a bad killing, but it wasn't racial, right? I mean, you know, the, the, we uh, last weekend, the 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 head of the um, some guy high up, I think, in the, the, the national security director or somebody at that level, the head of Homeland Security, said there's no such thing as systemic racism in the, in the law enforcement. Okay? I mean, so, so I'm just saying, I think it is, is valuable for us to recognize the tremendous gaps in perceptions between people. Mm -hmm. And I think, it, I think it's fine to rail against it and complain about it and be mad about it with people like yourself. But well, we got to be careful about what, what does that do for my own energy when I'm talking to that person? Because when I'm talking to that person, it does not help me to, to think that they're stupid, to be mad at them, and to decide to, to, to want to dismiss them. That's not going to help my persuasive power. So part of, what, part of the reason that this work I do with people is both about a strategy, but it's also about a kind of a, it's almost like a spiritual issue. Like you cannot be in a mindset of uh, where you're, you're, what you're filled up with is how stupid this other person is. That doesn't exactly, happen, right? exactly. Because then you come in with your dukes already up, and that's not what we're trying to do. David, come. I thank you so much. Uh, we can find David at the White Ally Toolkit dot com. White, white Ally, not the White Ally, White Ally Toolkit dot com. White Ally Toolkit dot com. I'm going to put it down here so you'll have a lower third that says it. Yeah. So basically, just to be clear. Uh, WhiteAllyToolkit.com is my um, is my project focusing on helping white people talk, but I'm also a consultant, and my LLC is the Dialogue Company. If people want to find me, so that, those are those are I, I'm still integrating both of those, I'm still working that out. But you can get from one to the other. Yeah, and, uh, you would be great to come into business places and help organizations open the dialogue. I think I you'd be I really great. At that. Bias trainings. My trainings are always enlightening and and enjoyable. You can do yeah. you can do work. And it's something and, people yeah. want to find me on Instagram or Twitter. It's all it's at the dialogue guy. Yeah. And check him out, y'all. If you go on YouTube, you will find some very interesting uh, I call them, they're almost like fun games that David puts people through. 
to help them recognize their own biases and how to have the dialogue, the, that, that most important dialogue. David, as always, we have been chit-chatting. We're always trying to keep a spotlight and ask the transparent and even ask the, 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 the crazy questions but to get the dialogue going. And I thank you so much. Continued success to you because this is your time, man. This is the time when, when people are going to need your tools and strategies. I, I, I certainly have a lot. I think like thinking myself, I have a lot to offer. And I appreciate the chance to be on your podcast and get the word out. And uh, if anybody, you know, I'm, I, I, I give keynote speeches. If you go to my website, you'll see I just gave a, a speech called From Slacktivism to Activism, What uh, White Allies Can Do in This Difficult Time. So I'm always trying to get the word out, and I would love, uh, love to be in other platforms to let people know that um, what we have to do to take advantage of this moment. That's right. I call it the reinvention of America. Here we go. Here we go. David, thank you so much. WhiteAllyToolkit.com. And thank you so much for listening to Rolanda On Demand. We'll be right back after this. Hey guys, I just want to say thank you so much for listening to this episode of Rolanda On Demand. I hope to be bringing you even more great podcasts that deal with race relations as we're all trying to figure this out and make America a better place for all of us. Continue the fight, continue the good fight, continue the dialogue, and continue to follow me on all forms of social media at Rolanda Watts. That's R-O-L-O-N-D-A. W-A-T-T-S. Yeah, I got enough T's in there, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, follow me. So nice to talk with you today. And uh, keep following us here on C-Suite Radio. Thank you and good day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.